Directions, please. Uh, yes, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-177-1578 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Members of the public trying to speak, please press star 9 to speak to the committee members. Mr. Chair, there's no one in public comment. Okay, well, we will uh, limit the fact that we have no comment for today's meeting. Uh, and with that, we will close public comment and let there's some objection from my colleagues. I see no objection. We will close public comment. Members, I'd like to uh, recommend that we move item number two on consent. Item two on consent. Uh, without objection, that will be the order. And I understand there's a technical amendment from the CLA on item four. That is correct, Chair. Uh, if I may, I am Oscar, Oscar Ishkola, the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. With regards to item number four on today's agenda, uh, we do request that uh, there be an amendment to the moving clauses for the motion. Um, if I can read the following amendment into the record. Please. Thank you. Um, so with regards to motion Cedillo de Leon relative to the funding of the Maya Corridor project, item four on today's Economic Development and Jobs Committee agenda, Council file 21-0537 be amended to replace the moving clauses with the following. I therefore move that the council action of November 8th, 2019 relative to approving the use of $2,087,544 in CRALA excess bond proceeds available to council district one from the Westlake redevelopment project area to the MacArthur Park improvements project be amended to reduce the, the approved amount to $300,000 and that the balance of $1,787,544 be reverted to its original source. The remaining moving clauses um, stay the same with the exception of, the, and rather than the next moving clause saying I therefore move, it changes to I further move. No other changes to the language in those two moving clauses. That concludes my, my request. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move that we approve the motion as amended. Does that require a second, Mr. Lid? Uh, second. Well, I'll second it for you. Been moved and seconded. Very good. Please call the roll. Uh, yes, Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Bloomingfield. Aye. And Councilmember Robin. I'm sorry. Is this for? <laughs> I lost the sound four. for a couple of minutes. Item four. I'm sorry. Um, okay, great. Okay. All right, sounds good. Right. Yes. That's a yes? Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, sorry. I just didn't hear what was happening for the last Oh, it's lesson. okay. Yeah. It's all right. You'll learn how to read lips as you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my Zoom froze for a second, so I just missed a little bit. <laughs> all right. Um, so item, um, item four is approved as amended. What's, uh, what's our next item, Mr. Lid? Uh, that would be item one, uh, discussion item, or we can uh, hear um, item two. Or excuse me, um, item three. All right, so item one. All righty. Item one is a discussion item. The Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation present Pathways for Economic Resiliency, Los Angeles County, 2021-2026. Okay, it's a topic we all, I know, are concerned about, the resiliency and kind of where we go from here and how we get there. Uh, the LA Economic Development uh, Commission has uh, done some extensive work uh, along with some other partners on this topic. And so we're pleased to invite Stephen Chung from the LADC, Paul Audley from Film LA, uh, Carly uh, Kirchen from Unite Here, 
and our very own Carolyn Ho from EWDD for some comments. Uh, the members will take some questions. So let's open it up. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, uh, council members. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'll be doing a quick presentation on the Pathways for Economic Recovery report. Uh, I want to note that this report was conducted um, uh, for all of LA County, and currently we're in discussions we, with EWDD to do a special report just for the city of Los Angeles. So the information I'll be providing you is looking at the full impact and totality of what happened with COVID-19 to our economy. Um, looking at 2020 and uh, what we're again, hopefully we can do a report soon for LA City that will be more focused on uh, the regions affecting the city of Los Angeles. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly and um, get into the reports. Great. Again, this report uh, was done by LADC at the end of 2020. So some of the information is a bit outdated, but we were able to pull some additional information about LA City to focus on the, the city of Los Angeles in a little bit. But I want to first uh, start with the pre-pandemic LA County uh, economic conditions so we can fully see the impact of what happened. At the end, beginning of 2020, at the end of uh, 2019, LA was actually doing quite well overall when you look at the surface. Our employment number was about 4.4% and our GDP uh, for the entire region was over $700 billion. In context, internationally speaking, if we were a country, we would be probably the 18th, 19th largest economy in the world. That's the size of Los Angeles County. And when it comes to employment number, we have over 4.5 million people in the Los Angeles County region that were employed. And you can see um, the, the GDP and the average wage been rising uh, over the last uh, decade and a half. However, as soon as 2019 hit, things changed very, very quickly in March. Within the first two months, we saw a drastic increase uh, in employment numbers. And what we saw also with, with our report was we found that five major industries were impacted the most. And this is what the report was really focused on. Hospitality, that includes accommodation and food services, non-essential retail, personal care, laundry services, arts, entertainment, recreation, motion pictures, and sound recording. You can see combined together the sharp decrease in those uh, jobs in, in the various districts throughout the entire region. And um, specifically looking at it, you can see food service and drinking places lost over 100,000 jobs in a very, very short time. And year to year, we lost uh, approximately over 437,000 jobs compared to, the, to, to um, what we had last year. And this is a couple months in from, from the pandemic already. And if you look at the, this particular chart, you can see the flow. We've been recovering somewhat over the last few months, but still we're uh, a lot behind. In fact, we're over 500,000 short, um, 500,000 jobs short of where we were at at the end of 2019. So um, as we're moving forward um, to this day, as of February, and the number has been increasing every single month. Um, so currently we're about 500, but still it's quite a large number compared to where we were at, at the beginning of 2020. Now, specifically with LA City, we pulled some number, just uh, updated information just for the city of Los Angeles. And you can see that month to month, uh, things have been changing, but when it comes to unemployment rate, there are over 200,000 individuals in Los Angeles City that still remain unemployed. Their employment base, as you can see, have dropped from uh, the beginning of 2020 to where we are right now with 1.855 million. And the percentage is also, as you can see, it's been fluctuating. It's been increasing since we're able to uh, open up the, the economy somewhat. And we expect that's going to continue to improve. But there's still a large population. And where we're going to focus on is basically the vulnerable population that have not been able to find job placements. So of the jobs that were, uh, were, were uh, lost, there's still about 40% of those jobs are still unrecovered. And compared to previous years, you can see that in April of 20, uh, 2020, um, the, the unemployment rate reached a staggering 18.6% for, for the region. And as it is coming down uh, in, in, in the current months, it's still over 10%. I'm going to switch a little bit to uh, the specific, specifically the populations that are most impacted. As we saw, the impact was not uh, equivalent throughout the entire region as uh, when it comes to age, when it comes to ethnicity. You can see our black and brown population uh, have received a, a, a higher share of the employment rates. And this is throughout, not only in Los Angeles, but throughout California as well. And for those who are younger and for those who have less education attainment, those are the most vulnerable population when it comes to how the COVID-19 is impacting the economy. Now, 
we want to highlight um, as this, these numbers are, I'm going to go through quite a lot of numbers. So I will share this information with you and it's also going to be in the report. But you can see for those who are under 34, there's a higher percentage of those who have filed unemployment insurance. And when it comes to communities of color, uh, the African-American black population have uh, reported a higher amount of unemployment insurance compared to the general uh, population. Another thing to note is the Hispanic or Latino population reported a lower amount. And what we found in some of the anecdotal story is that some of them uh, have not filed for unemployment insurance based on uh, perception of um, um, immigration status and some fear of uh, retaliation or various things that might be happening uh, within our government system. So they have not applied for employment insurance the way that we were expecting um, the general population to be applying. And I was also mentioning with uh, with, with demographics, when um, uh, Paired with education attainment, we see that folks with a high school education or less have filed for unemployment insurance a lot higher rate than the general population as well. And of course, uh, as we see, this is also a national trend. Um, we have a higher percentage of females leaving the workforce or are filing for unemployment insurance based on uh, the statistics that we've received. On top of the vulnerable population, we know that uh, from the LASA report in June, July of 2020, there's approximately 66,000 individuals experiencing homelessness, and that number is estimated to be increased throughout uh, the, the rest of the year. At the same time, we also saw that there are a lot of businesses that closed, um, and with Los Angeles County, about 93% of all our businesses have less than 20 employees. In fact, 87% of LA County businesses have less than um, nine employees, what we see as micro enterprises. And many of them, you can see at the, this is the self-reporting uh, uh, data that we received from Yelp. You can see Los Angeles compared to some of the other cities like San Francisco or Dallas, we lost more, more companies and the, the amount of uh, company closure were a lot faster rate than some of the other regions because we have such a high concentration of small businesses and micro enterprises. And a lot of these restaurants, retail trade, as we're talking about, um, are, were most uh, impacted. And as we're seeing some of the recovery on the right hand side, uh, construction, for example, 75% of those jobs were recovered. But when it comes to, uh, uh, for example, recreation, uh, or when it comes to arts, entertainment, recreation, those uh, numbers were a lot less when it comes to recovery. And so we see a continual trend in terms of the struggles, uh, especially for accommodation and food ser services, it's going to take them a while to recover some of those jobs. Now, when it comes to the workforce uh, occupation, we're seeing uh, additional trends as well. As we're projecting uh, how we're gonna be recovering, we're expecting that's gonna take us a few years, at least 2022 to 2024, before we can return to the 4.5 million job base that we had previously. And especially when it comes to living wage jobs, back in 2020, uh, based on the MIT study, the, the uh, living wage was at 30,800 per individual for a single individual. That number has since increased to over 40,000 based on the estimate. And if we're gonna be creating more living wage uh, jobs for the region in order for us to accommodate for the 4.5 million workers, we're gonna have to create over 700,000 uh, living wage jobs for the entire region in, in order for us to catch up. And as we're going into the future, you can also see um, the, the growth industries that will be available as we're projecting, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, warehouse and transportation services, uh, construction, advanced manufacturing, and public administrations are all projected to grow over the next few years. And we're also seeing the middle skill occupations in terms of where the pathways are. So as we're looking at the projection in 2024, some of these um, occupations will continue to hire. And so we see that for the displaced workers, this might be an opportunity for them to enter this new market. We have a couple of recommendations that we made for, for the region in terms of how we're going to be able to get it together. So we're going to go really quickly through some of them. Mainly it's about uh, targeting the displaced workers and how do you basically place them into appropriate um, uh, upskilling and job training in order for them to prepare for the, the jobs that are growing and how do you help those businesses grow. At the same time, as we're looking at COVID safety and 19 um, safety, things are changing very quickly. So that recommendation was made as of uh, December. But another thing that I want to highlight is that this report found a huge gap when it comes to digital divide, as many of you already uh, are aware. And what we're seeing is that um, as some of the transitions are happening, as people are getting laid out, they're forced to, to work from home. If you have reliable, affordable internet service, that's great. If you don't, like many of Angelinos, you're basically being forced out of a job. So looking at the, the target population, we're seeing that a lot of, unfortunately, the, the uh, lower access rate for 
uh, internet access are also located in uh, communities of color and also LMI, uh, lower uh, and moderate income neighborhoods as well. So combined together, we feel that it's very important for um, uh, focus to be done on uh, access to broadband uh, for, for all. So I know that's a lot of information that we, we provided in just a short time. Um, the hope is that we can answer some of your questions, but also to do a more uh, a comprehensive economic analysis for the city of Los Angeles so we can target the populations as well as, as the industries uh, that will uh, need additional support as we're looking at economic recovery. With that, I'm going to pass uh, the, the uh, floor back to uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, yeah. Members, we're going to, we're going to take, uh, hear all the presentations, I think. So just jot down some notes and then we'll come back. Uh, and I see we've been joined by uh, Councilman Marquis Sears Dawson. So uh, next up, we've got uh, Paul Audley from Film LA. Paul? Thank you, Council Member Price and, and members of the committee. Um, the good news for us really is that the industry is pretty much back at the same numbers it was in 2019 now as far as production. So that's very, very good news. We're hearing from most of our partners in the unions and guilds that they're looking for people. Um, they're fully engaged and active. Uh, and that's good news today. It means that we're recovering though. Um, we spent uh, 20, the year 2020 uh, at about uh, under 60% of normal overall for the full year. Uh, and we saw some uh, ups and downs very much like the chart Stephen showed uh, that went right along with the COVID numbers. So you know, as you recall, when we had the massive increase in COVID cases in January, uh, voluntary shutdown of the industry happened and it collapsed again. But even with that, um, the first quarter of this year showed only a small decrease of January, February, March of 3.3%, which meant February and March were massive returns uh, of the industry, largely television, which is our key driver now for the film industry in our region, um, with uh, television uh, going up over 51% um, this year over, over last. So the good news in all of that is we're on the right track. We're heading back. Uh, you may be aware that the Appendix J, which governs film industry by the LA County Health Department will be uh, removed on June 15th. And the unions and guilds that have their own agreements on how to work safely with the film industry, um, those agreements expire June 30th and they're working on moving those forward. Uh, the Department of Health will issue best practice guidelines for the film industry going forward after after June 15th, but they will not be requirements uh, anymore. And uh, just very recently, Cal OSHA, which had not updated its uh, workplace requirements at all um, since the start of the pandemic, updated the requirements, uh, which will also affect the film industry. So we've seen it come back. Uh, we see good news. And the interesting thing for us is we have struggled year after year after year here to attract back the uh, large uh, feature films. We have several on the books right now, and that's largely because LA has recovered so well, where some of our competitor countries and cities um, are still struggling. And so those tax credits and things that might have lured them to Australia, not real attractive now when you have to quarantine everybody for several weeks and they have uh, severe restrictions. And the other very good news to me in this, and we've been um, talking about this for several years, is the film industry is now sliding over into the construction industry with three major projects of sound stages being proposed now for our region, one of which just landed for you all um, at uh, Hackman for Atlas Capital in the LA Times building. That'll be 17 new stages eventually over time. Um, six more at Echelon Studios on Santa Monica and Television City's plan for its future um, includes 15 additional stages at their site. Um, and the thing I loved most, by the way, about Television City, as you all review these, is they made their parking structures so that they can base camp on site. This is a huge thing as we lose more and more ability to use streets um, as we modernize the city. And so I'm so grateful to the folks at Television City um, and the Hackman Group for doing that, for making their parking structure capable of being a base camp with trucks and, and cast and crew parking. So good news in construction industry around the film industry, but also for the film industry itself. 
Um, Film LA is in a recovery year this year. Um, we had uh, substantial reserves specifically for some kind of shutdown of the industry, whether it be pandemic, natural disaster, or strikes. Um, so we survived uh, with some reduction in staff, and we're now hiring. So if you know people looking for work, tell them to go to our website. We have 11 open positions. Uh, thanks very much, council members, and I'll be standing by if there are questions. Okay, thank you much, Paul. Appreciate that uh, that report. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Carly from Unite Here. Carly Kirchin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, my name is Carly Kirchin. I'm with uh, Unite. I'm a research analyst with Unite Here Local 11, where we represent over 30,000 workers throughout the hospitality industry, including hotels, event centers events centers and stadiums um uh you know 90 percent of our members uh were laid off within days of uh declaration of pandemic back in march 2020 um our industry has really suffered and our members have suffered um you know tremendously in the past year um while some folks have recently returned to work over the past few weeks, many relate, remain laid off and hotel occupancy has really come in fits and spurts. Um, the future of business travel and conferences in particular remains precarious and event workers largely work still. Um, Meanwhile, um, you know, what we've seen uh, nationally and, of course, in our region, um, U.S. hotels have received, uh, received uh, 13, uh, sorry, uh, par pardon me for one moment. Is anyone else having trouble hearing or is it just my connection? Oh, I'm yeah, so just, uh, in and out like a bad cell phone connection or something. <laughs> yeah, Carly. Oh, no, I'm a robot. I want to hear. I want to hear you. I want to hear every word you're saying. Uh, maybe if you turn your video off. Yeah, I so. Um, I'm gonna try going video off. Is this any better? Get, try, talk. Let's try and see. Okay. Um, hopefully this is better, you all. Um, just holler if it's not okay. Um, so as I was saying. Um, U.S. hotels have received $13.7 billion in Paycheck Protection Program loans from the Small Business Administration, in part through exemptions that made hotel chains eligible for taxpayer aid and granted hotels more money than other borrowers. Although Congress intended PPP funds to be used to return workers to payroll, the number of hotel jobs from May 2020 to April 2021 averaged only 17 percent greater than the number number of hotel jobs in April 2020 after the pandemic caused a sharp drop in hotel employment. While hotels have not brought the vast majority of their employees back to work, they were required to spend 60% of PPP loan proceeds on payroll costs to qualify for full loan forgiveness. As of May 24th, SBA had forgiven and paid back over uh, 279 billion in PPP loans to all industries while denying forgiveness for only 1 billion. But because the SBA has not disclosed whether the vast majority of individual hotels have received loan forgiveness, in most cases it's impossible to determine uh, which hotels claim to have spent PPP funds on payroll from loan forgiveness data. Um, in, according to some of our own analysis of 24 Southern California and Arizona hotels that have received PPP, 42% appear not to qualify for full loan forgiveness. Um, to provide one example, the luxury uh, Chateau Marmont Hotel in West Hollywood uh, received a uh, $1.95 million PPP loan on February 5th in uh, 2021, um, which was tied to 151 jobs. Last March, the Chateau fired more than 200 of its workers, leaving workers who had dedicated decades of their lives to the hotel without job security or company provided health care during the pandemic. 
Only a small fraction of laid off Chateau workers have been re returned to their jobs. But similar to most other hotel borrowers, data reported to the SBA does not state whether the Chateau has spent PPP funds on payroll or applied for loan forgiveness. There's a long way to go in terms of recovery of the hospitality industry, especially recovery that actually benefits workers. Um, the way that we're moving forward hospitality recovery in the city right now, we believe is somewhat backwards. Um, the city is considering large zoning changes via the Hollywood and downtown community plans, which currently incentivize hotel development, um, all, you know, all while existing hotels struggle to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And at the same time, the city is not enforcing its own home sharing ordinance, which regulates short term rentals. Not only are these SDR units not being used as much needed housing, they're also in direct competition with existing hotels for a limited pool of returning tourists in our city. We have also seen motions in city council which would expand STR use. We believe this is a bad policy decision. It's bad to incentivize short-term rentals over um, traditional existing hotels because TOT taxes are guaranteed when tourists stay in existing hotels. You know, so we, just in conclusion, we really encourage the city to prioritize housing over new hotel development um, in the downtown and Hollywood community plan updates and to enforce the home sharing ordinance. Taking strong action on both of these issues will help ensure a hospitality industry that is a recovery that is equitable for our members and non-union hospitality workers across the region. Um, I very much appreciate your time today. Um, we love being a part of this discussion. I hope that the um, I didn't get cut off too much uh, with a robot voice at the beginning of this um, and uh, I will stay on for questions as well if anyone has any. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carly. Uh, I think we did hear most of your presentation, uh, but there may be some questions, follow-up questions to you. Uh, last, but certainly not least, we have our own GM for EWDD, Carolyn Hull. Good afternoon, council members. It's a pleasure to see you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And, and thank you, LAEDC, Film LA, Unite Here, for those thorough and thought-provoking presentations. These types of analytics are an integral part of EWDD's ongoing commitment to data-driven solutions that prioritize equity. As the department charged with implementing the city's vision for creating economic opportunity for all Angelinos, We've seen the devastation caused by the pandemic on minority-owned businesses, on minority-owned small businesses, as well as low-income job seekers uh, firsthand. We've also seen the disparate economic impact on women, youth ages 16 to 24, and people of color. Over the past 15 months, EWDD has responded to the collapse of the regional economy by creating numerous grant and loan programs to help small businesses, micro-entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and childcare providers keep their doors open. During this time period, the department got over $65 million in the hands of Los Angelinos to support small businesses. We've launched new workforce development programs focused on providing displaced workers with emergency supports needed immediately after the economic shock through the Keep LA Working Initiative. We've created new programs that also provided transitional employment opportunities for displaced workers through the Los Angeles Community Cares Corp and increased youth employment opportunities. We're supporting the city's reopening efforts by launching a new partnership with LA Unified School District that will place more than 50 dislocated, sorry, uh, which, will, sorry, which will place more than 50 displaced workers at LAUSD campuses cleaning and disinfecting classrooms. As we look to our new program year, I'm excited about the new opportunities to expand our programming through both the mayor's equity budget and the upcoming Workforce Development System Annual Plan. In the new year, keep on doing this. Uh, in the new year, we anticipate launching numerous new initiatives, including a $50 million financial assistance program to support businesses as they recover from the pandemic-induced economic downturn. The department will be enhancing the services provided by our business source centers and expanding their reach into underserved communities while providing much needed additional services. In addition, we look forward to implementing the JEDI Zone program and activating underutilized city properties to support living wage jobs. On the workforce development side, 
The year 22 annual plan will include more than 24 million in funding for youth employment, including new initiatives funded by the mayor's equity budget, such as the Angelino Corp and Student to Student Success Pilot. The plan also sets aside $1 million in a youth employment equity fund to support innovative new strategies that promote high barrier youth. The annual plan will include more than 11 million in funding for the LA RISE program that provides economic opportunity for homeless and justice involved Angelinos. This funding level represents more than an 85% increase over the years, uh, over last year's annual plan. The annual plan will include 4.8 million in new investments to support single parents impacted by the pandemic so that they can return to the workforce by providing childcare support for up to six months, as well as provide new vocational training for up to 500 single parents. In conclusion, the EWDD team looks forward to working with all of you as we implement these transformative programs during the next fiscal year. Thank you very much, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Ol. We appreciate your, uh, your comments and your summary. Uh, and it really was a prequel to what we have coming up. Uh, at our next meeting, in fact, we're going to be talking about the, the annual plan, the Jedi Zones, legacy businesses, and the small business grant program, uh, several of the uh, programs you just highlighted. So we yeah, appreciate uh, appreciate your efforts and that of your staff and all the presentations. They were very, very, uh, very informative, um, like uh, drinking out of a fire hose, though, right? Lots of, lots of good information. Uh, I just got a couple, then I'll, I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Um, uh, Stephen, you talked a, a little bit about the uh, uh, the digital access or, or lack thereof, and, and I know that has been an issue for several of us on the committee. It was an issue during the budget, you know, how we can uh, uh, make sure resources go into the right place. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about what you think we can do to uh, address the digital divide. How, how should we be investing resources? What, what steps? Uh, different or unique step you think we should be taking uh, as we address uh, that specific issue of involvement, inclusion, and equity in terms of the digital footprint? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we found that um, we're currently actually doing a lot more work since we, we released the report. Uh, LADC has partnered with Unite LA to create something called the LADL, the Los Angeles Digital Equity Action League, specifically looking to address this very issue of access and equity. And what we found is that besides, you know, sometimes traditionally we're talking about the infrastructure development, which is a huge component of this, but also digital literacy. Uh, and when we say digital literacy, sometimes it, it doesn't, um, we have to look at the various elements because Los Angeles is so diverse with over 140 nationality represented with over 220 uh, languages spoken one size doesn't fit all. And that's why it has to be a ground, uh, ground up and from a community-based approach to really listen to, to the various issues. For, for those who are uh, um, uh, senior citizens who might not have the comfort level to those who might have um, uh, trust issues with some of the government agencies that are providing the, the information as well as language barriers. So digital literacy is gonna be a huge uh, component of this. Another aspect is also affordability. Uh, sometimes you get um, these deals that you can sign up for for a low rate and what affordable rate it's up to for interpretation. So it needs to be standardized in many ways. And so whether it's through subsidies, whether it's through additional programs, how do you make sure that is sustainable? Also, when it comes to devices, it has to be uh, sustainable as well, because a lot of times you get one uh, computer system. Next thing you know, they're outdated. And especially for uh, education, a lot of students who receive uh, free laptops um, and their hotspot, which is great, but once they transition into community colleges or college, their laptop is now not theirs anymore. So what's going to happen to them during that transition period? So all these issues need to be addressed and it's, it needs to be done community by community. And that's why you need to do a, a really a ground-based approach to understand where the issues are and then come up with the community partners to create these solutions uh, region by region, community by community. So a lot of times what we're seeing is a top-down approach with a general uh, um, a recommendation in terms of what, what one recommendation can do. But for a region as diverse as Los Angeles City, we need to have uh, really many, many different approaches. And, and also, I think for, for you, Stephen, uh, there, there, there was a, a uh, reference to housing construction. We know what a big driver that is in the overall economy. Uh, what uh, what trends do, do we see in terms of uh, housing construction 
over the next few years as uh, as we come back. Well, the demand is going to be there, but as we've seen, um, the construction uh, material prices have increased significantly. So it's going to be more costly for, for construction. We're looking at it from an economic development standpoint. So the jobs potentially can be can be there. But what we need to do is make sure that as uh, there's a population that have left the workforce, we need to make sure that we retrain our, our workers to be able to get into the construction um, uh, uh, sector, but also ensure that they're able to secure good paying jobs because there are different types of construction jobs. So it'll be important for, for their upskilling, their training to get, to guide them in the right path. Uh, and construction can be both from a residential uh, uh, housing uh, construction standpoint, as well as retail, as well as warehouse. And as we're looking at international trade as well, as uh, I've spoken to many of uh, the council members in this room before, talking about the importance of international trade, e-commerce continues to be a major driver for what potentially can be um, uh, economic driver for this region. So if we're able to build those sectors combined together, there might be more construction that can be down the line. Uh, and then lastly, how do you think the LA County's recovery uh, compares to other parts of the state and, and the nation? Are we going to be leading the uh, pack again or, or for some reason not? That's a really um, nuanced question. Uh, the reason is because even in, uh, I was giving you the number in 2019, it was looking very rosy for us. Um, it looked like, you know, with our GDP over $700 billion with uh, 4.5 million uh, people being employed, but our our homeless issue has continued to be very uh, significant. Our income divide issues are very significant as well. So I think everybody heard this term before, um, COVID-19 revealed and exacerbated our, our economic inequities. So I think we're in the same situation right now, but even uh, more dire of the situation. So as we're looking at recovery, I think overall, the LA economy is going to grow very quickly because of our resiliency, because of the various industries that are here. However, there's going to be a large portion of our population that's going to be even more at risk than ever before. And so we need to start looking at targeted approach and how do you provide the resources to make sure that we don't leave them behind. Well, yes, I agree. It's all about a targeted approach. And that's why we uh, need to have collaboration, cooperation. We've got to figure that out because it's not a one size fits all and, and no one single answer. So. And if uh, I can also commend um, uh, EWDD and Carolyn's team for, for their great work uh, this entire year. It's been great partnering with them and watching uh, the great work that they've done. Uh, you know, for, for LADC, we, we have our business assistance program. And uh, traditionally, we, we all sign up to basically provide these resources. And it's been a very happy job for many. But unfortunately, over the last year, uh, we have to do a lot of triage. We have to basically hear many, many stories over and over and over again of these business closures. And to see what the city of Los Angeles, under your leadership and under Carolyn's leadership and guidance as well, is able to provide these direct services to really mitigate the, the pain that's felt throughout the community, it's really inspiring. So I want to thank all the council members here and the city of Los Angeles and, and Carolyn for, for your leadership. Thank you. That I think the collaboration with LAEDC uh, and uh, EWDD has been significant. Uh, and I think both organizations have stepped up at a time when it was necessary. Let's go to questions. Uh, Council Member uh, Bob Blumenfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for all these reports. Uh, it's, they were all very informative uh, and, and really interesting, of course. Uh, and the film LA report was, was surprisingly good, so that was a, a you know, very positive news to get. I had a couple of questions, and, and Stephen, start with a very uh, with a very technical one, which was, I was a little baffled on the on the charts. I think it was on page twelve or something. There was a spike in unemployment in April of twenty one, uh, both on the uh, number of people employed and the unemployment, and I didn't understand why that was, and I just got caught up in that. Okay, it's, 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 is there did did I miss something? Why why would there be a spike in April of twenty one, or do you know? Yes, uh, sorry, Council Member. I think that slide you're referring to, um, I think the way we presented it might have been a bit confusing. We were trying to compare it with 2020, uh, April of 21, with April of 2020, and April of 19. So, where you saw the big spike is actually April of 2020. So, you can see year to year. So, it's actually, uh, in comparison, it's been actually quite flat. So there's not a spike in April of 2021, but it's April of 2020 where the spike is. We just placed place it too close to each other. And so, it's looking a bit confusing. Okay, good. Yeah, as we were going through them quickly, but I noticed it was the same spike on the two on the employment and on the unemployment. So that's that makes more sense to me. I just didn't know if I was missing something. Great. Um, the uh, in terms of uh, some other issues, the um, 
the restaurant industry, you know, the report describes the hospitality industry as, as a, obviously one of the hardest hit sectors of the economy. I've heard that we've lost like a third of our, our restaurants and want to talk about some of the recovery strategies for restaurant owners in, uh, in the months ahead. You know, how do you think they have to be differently? Uh, how do we think differently to be less vulnerable to the economic downturns that we're experiencing? And what do you see uh, in that sector? Part of this uh, report that we conducted is not just a, a, a macroeconomic research. We actually cre created. Um, your your mic, you're, you're far from the mic. Something going on with your audio. Sorry. There Can you, you hear go. me better now? Yes. Sorry, I was blocking my own mic. Uh, so uh, we were also doing industry convenings to uh, collect information directly from the industries. And what we've been hearing also directly from the restaurants is that, especially for the smaller restaurants, as we're looking at recovery, they're going to need access to capital. Uh, so capital access can be a very important uh, aspect. And if we can work together with the city to create opportunities and, and investment opportunities to, uh, to to these individuals, that would be great. Second is permitting process as well. A lot of the times it takes a bit longer for, for them to be able to reopen. Uh, and some of them are now have left the industry and want to attract new investors. So the permitting process in terms of working directly with the city uh, to expedite that process and to facilitate um, a, a more quick way of basically permitting will be very important so th those are the two major issues that we keep on hearing over and over again when it comes to restaurants yeah, and we've, we've obviously moved the restaurant beverage program and we're trying to move a number of other things what about and i didn't see any reference to this but what about the um the sort of rent cliff uh, you, you know we always talk about the the eviction cliff when it comes to uh to renters when we're talking about individuals but there's that same cliff is waiting for a number of businesses as well uh, and I know that we, there are programs uh, out there to help folks with rent, but do you see, you know, is there any prediction of, of, of hitting that cliff and, and what are folks doing about it? And is that, a, is that going to cause a, uh, a, a, an economic cliff as well once the moratorium is gone? On the um, I, that's a really uh, great question in the sense that we were looking more at the job impact from um, the employees. You're getting the audio oh. issue again. There you go. So, but we're also hearing quite a lot when it comes to especially uh, how helpful it was to receive financial assistance from the city to be able to take care of some of the rent issues with the moratorium. And as is moving forward, it's unknown what's going to happen. If their business recover in a very quick manner, they might be able to be able, uh, be able to sustain uh, the, the the changes. However, if it's not going to be a quick recovery when, uh, when it comes to the revenue, then that might be a major, major issue down the line. Is that reflected in this report anywhere? Or is that it is not? It is not reflected in the reports. Uh, we were again looking more at uh, the the employment base, and we haven't spent as much time. And these are the things that this is a preliminary report in many ways, because to look at the impact of COVID nineteen to all of LA County, uh, even though this report is over three hundred pages, it's still not enough to for us to look at every single issue. But having these kind of conversations is helping us kind of hone in moving down the line, where this, where's the fo focus area we need to do to st uh, do more analysis? Great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Bob? Uh, I maybe want to come back to me, but go, you can go to the other. Okay. Councilwoman Raman, please. Well, I, you know, actually, my, this great report, so many stats, I could barely absorb it. Uh, it was so many different slides, but um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, as I've been reading about LA's recovery relative to other metropolitan areas, one thing I found is that LA's unemployment um, is higher, LA's recovery seems to be slower than other metropolitan areas across this country. And I wondered, I know you focused on LA area, um, but Compared to other areas, is there a reason why we might be lagging behind other metropolitan areas? What are the risk factors that are here that are leading to that? There are a number of different issues. Uh, one is that, uh, as I was mentioning, with Los Angeles County, uh, over 93% of our co uh, companies here have less than 20 employees. They're small businesses. And because of that, uh, compared to some of the other regions where they have less small businesses, they are less vulnerable in that sense, and the recovery could be a bit quicker. Um, what, and, what is the average percentage, like in other cities, like 93% is unusually high in your... It's unusually high, yeah. Well, it depends on which, uh, for, for may, may, um, uh, has to be compared to a bit. So San Francisco, for example, has a much, I believe they're in the 
probably 60, 70 percentage. Uh, so it's 90, 93% is really high. So it just basically depends on the, on the various cities. So um, the other thing is, uh, as I was talking about the, the various um, uh, industries that we have here, many of our, our, our population is so big and so, so diverse. We're, we're not just one city, right? We're 80 different cities. So the makeup of those cities really have, have uh, contributed to, to um, the time it's gonna take for us to recover uh, because of the focus on their, their industry sector as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Marquis Harris Dawson, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, convening this uh, very, very important discussion. Uh, props to everybody for great uh, reports uh, about our, our region and our city and our, our sort of our signature industry. Uh, in, in film. Uh, I have to say, uh, I have to apologize because I came into it part way. Um, but the, literally the first slide I saw, Mr. Chong, was the slide about the, 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 the differences in impact and unemployment between racial groups. Um, and, you know, at one level, you expect to see a disparate impact, uh, unfortunately. Of black people, almost anything negative, you expect it to affect black people more and anything positive, you expect black people to uh, have less access to it. Uh, but these numbers were far greater than normal. Uh, so, you know, so we, there's normally a gap in unemployment between black workers and other workers, but the gap here was exponentially bigger um, than uh, the unemployment gap typically is. Uh, and I just wondered if you had any explanations for that. Uh, was it because it was in certain industries? Uh, what, is there a way to account for it other than race? It's um, this report, uh, again, it's not uh, doing the deep dive that we need to. It just opened up the for conversation. And I think this, these issues, uh, we all knew and uh, we all suspected, but it just confirmed our suspicion. And I'll add another uh, aspect to those numbers that you saw that's even more alarming. If you combine race with education attainments, what you see is for African-American and uh, black employees that are uh, with a high school education or less, the employment uh, rate in terms of for the, for the cohort that they file for employment insurance is in the 80% percentile, compared to about 40 something percent for some of the other general populations. So, uh, it's a systemic issue. I think it just basically revealed itself. And again, COVID-19 just basically exaggerated the situation. But in terms of understanding it, I think we need to do more analysis for us to really understand. But it is a structural issue in terms of the industries uh, that they're working in. We actually have another report that we'll be releasing uh, on Thursday. This is uh, with the Center for Competitive Workforce. LADC has a partnership with the community college districts. And what we were looking at is um, occupations through the lens of race and ethnicity. And what we found is that basically for some of the population, for, for some of the industries and occupations uh, that are um, lower paying, there's an overrepresentation of black and brown workers in the Los Angeles region. So the question is basically, how do we transform that? What kind of education upskilling programs we need to do in order to get them uh, into better paying jobs? And uh, I want to also address uh, uh, Council Member uh, Raman's uh, question earlier. In terms of the detail with all the information with this report, there is a lot of information to absorb. So for each of the council members, if it's useful, uh, we'll be happy to come to you directly and brief you on the information that you would like so that you can get a better understanding. Uh, and later on, when we're doing a more detailed analysis on the city of Los Angeles, we get a better understanding in terms of the, the issues that you want to uh, investigate as well. And uh, so uh, just to follow that uh, train, thank you for that answer. And, and we'd love a, a briefing once that the additional report that you uh, referred to is finished and released. We'd love to get that uh, in our council, in my council office. I'd love to get that. Uh, also, just curious if um, if uh, Film LA uh, or uh, EWDD found similar data or uh, can shed any light on that data uh, on that number that we saw. Hey, council member, um, we don't actually have access to data on demographics of who's working. Um, so I don't have anything uh, that's helpful to you in that line. Okay. 
Good afternoon, council members. I think in, in the work that we've done with small businesses directly, what we've seen is that unfortunately many of our small businesses and underserved communities and people of color have uh, limited reserves, capital reserves, based uh, compared to uh, people of, uh, of other ethnic groups. Uh, and I do think, and, and, and I think the data probably will, will wait for uh, LADC to do their, their analysis, but it, it's also the industries that have been impacted. If you looked at uh, Stephen's charts, what he showed, and, and, and it was excellent work, was that it's the hospitality industries, the personal service industries. These are industries that you overlay uh, people of color dominate in those industries. So uh, the managerial class, for example, wasn't as impacted as COVID because many of the managerial class could work from home. So I think what the data is showing us is that people of color are concentrated in, in hospitality and personal services in those industry sectors. Couple that with a, with a lack of reserves, and I think that those are, those are major factors. All right, so uh, Mr. Chair, that means we need a program for our salons and, and barbershops to get back open uh, <laughs> right away, among other, among, among other things. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, last question is really to all three of you, and, and I will apologize. I'm breaking a rule of politics uh, that says in a hearing, don't ask, don't ask a question that you don't know the answer to. I legitimately don't know the answer to this, and if you don't, I think it's fine too. But last summer, uh, lots of large corporations, financial institutions made these grand commitments to uh, focus on the black community. Um, and they said, you know, in response to the George Floyd protests, we're going to invest this much money or we're going to hire this many people. I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, especially in the film industry, but beyond, uh, are, are we keeping track of that? Are you all keeping track of that? Is there a role that we can play to have some accountability for, for folks making good on their commitments? Because uh, it just seems like we're in a period where, every, where there are more people saying uh, that they acknowledge racism and that they acknowledge anti-Black sentiment and they want to be helpful, but it seems like in many ways, it's not having any impact on, uh, on the conditions. Of course, we in the government here, you know, our greatest harm reduction strategy of affirmative action has been effectively taken away from us by the voters. So we're limited, but the private sector is not. And so I'm, I'm wondering to the extent that you all are keeping track of that or anybody's keeping track of that and how we might push on that. Uh, council member, we, as I said, we don't have demographic direct information. What I do know is that there was a lot of activity leading up to the uh, COVID coming in. And since uh, the re re uh, restart of the film industry, a lot of inquiries to us about partners that the uh, industries can use to help feed them with underrepresented groups. And so we've got that inventory list, we're offering those out, but they don't report back to us. I do, however, serve on the county's workforce development task force which um, is tasked with that question, which is what is the change and is there an improvement? Um, they haven't met uh, this quarter, and so I don't know if there's any update on that, but um, uh, through the CEO's office there, they may have some data for you. Thank you. And, and, and further on that uh, question, Councilman, I've, I've read an article uh, the other day, and it spoke of how uh, a number of uh, shareholder meetings around the country now, uh, at shareholder meetings, that issue is coming up. In other words, shareholders asking management to, to be accountable to promises made. And so perhaps we'll see some pressure internally and externally uh, holding folks uh, feet to the fire and making sure that, that people are following through on uh, promises made in the heat of passion, we'll say. Uh, Mr. Kikorian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And Mr. Harris Dawson, I didn't know about that rule. Actually, I, I ask questions that I'm clueless about all the time. So I, I and I make no bones about it. Um, it so let me start actually with uh, Mr. Audley and, and prove that point, because I'm embarrassed that I don't know this, but can you, what is the current status of the California Film and Television Production Tax Incentive? I mean, are, how, What's the funding level? What you know? How how are we doing when it comes to our support from our friends in the state legislature? So we we continue to have the three hundred thirty million dollar program. The governor, uh, with the surplus of the state, has added thirty million additional for returning television because that portion of the tax credit 
was fully consumed and unavailable to attract television back to LA at a time when it really, really wanted to come back. Um, so they've added 30 million this year to it. Uh, and there's undergoing some regulatory changes to try to allow uh, the film commission to move funds between these pieces of the pie that currently are boxes of money they can't move so that if they have a huge demand on television and not on feature, they can move the funding instead of carrying it over. So they continue to be supportive. Um, this year we did get that little bump, which is really helpful. Uh, and uh, it's huge demand way beyond what the state has its resources to offer. Well, uh, as, as always, uh, but I thought that the really good news that you shared in addition to getting back to pretty much full employment was that we're starting to get uh, feature film, large feature film production, which we've always kind of lagged behind uh, in, in recent years on, and the increase of, uh, of uh, infrastructure, um, soundstage capacity, particularly for television, is, is going to be a key thing, but we got to stay competitive with that tax uh, incentive as yes, well. We and um, it, the uh, prioritization of projects for the tax incentive does include consideration of inclusiveness in hiring, does it not? It does, and it also has um, requirements for spending um, on it, which is one of the places it's been fascinating to me to continuously be able to say to a group, um, are you on the list at the California Film Commission? Because the industry is constantly looking for places to mentor, to hire, to do service, to donate money. And how many organizations that are training young people and adults into this industry um, are not. Uh, and so if you've got local organizations or friends and groups, make sure they're on the CFC's list for the industry to go and reach out to to help meet those requirements and provide these extra services. It's a pretty critical part of the program, I think. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I first just want to thank you for organizing this because having this comprehensive set of reports, I think, is um, critical to us charting our course over the course of the next year or so of recovery. And thank you to all of the presenters. Um, and Mr. Chung, you mentioned uh, having a more targeted uh, report on the city and working with EWD, uh, EWDD towards uh, that end. Uh, I really welcome that. And in particular, you should know if you don't already, uh, that um, our budget for the coming year included substantial set-asides for uh, child care infrastructure investments, child care business support, uh, restaurant business support, small business support, the launch of our JEDI zones, uh, and, uh, you know, assistance to businesses that are getting started, um, and, and a number of other areas that are very closely aligned to your set of recommendations. And uh, while the money is set aside, the policy has not yet developed, been developed on many of those things. It has on the Jedi zones, not much on the others. So it's very timely that uh, those recommendations are coming forward. And I think it's, it's very urgent that we get that city specific report back. And uh, I, I, for one, and I'm sure everybody on the council would, would welcome uh, you know, drilling down your uh, further recommendations and, and, of course, Ms. Hull's on, uh, you know, more specific recommendation, policy recommendations on utilizing those resources uh, to best effect. And it's, so it's, it's kind of things are coming together here in a way that I think could show great promise. Um, but we need to be really thoughtful about how we how we proceed. And so you're you're in your collective input in that would be very helpful. So thank Thanks, you. Sir. Thank you for being here today and thanks for continuing to work with us on that. So thank you. Yeah, I want to thank uh, all of the, uh, the uh, panelists for, for their contributions. Uh, and as my colleagues have indicated, uh, you know, this is critically important as we chart, a, chart the, the steps for the future, figuring out where we are and what resources are available. Uh, and so I look, we look forward, uh, uh, Stephen, to the city-specific uh, report. I'm sure uh, each of us would like to get a briefing on that, but we'll be, we'll be bringing everyone back 
in a quarter or so just to kind of get an update. Uh, Carly, that includes you too. So uh, just want you to know we appreciate uh, the comments that, that have been made uh, and the uh, thought that's going into these reports. Uh, you know, especially if you try to figure out next steps. So again, I just want to thank you all. If members, any other comments, closing comments? If not, we will, uh, there's no recommendation. We'll just uh, receive the uh, reports as presented and look forward to an update uh, at, a, uh, at a date in the future. Okay. Thank you. Next item, Mr. 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 Lid. Uh, CAO report and Workforce Development Board slash EWDD reports relative to the distribution of $2 million in homeless housing and prevention program funds to Los Angeles Regional Initiative for Special Enterprise, LA Rise. Okay, LA Rise, another important tool in the in the toolbox. Uh, so we've got a report from uh, CAO and EWDD. Yes, good Ms. afternoon. Ms. Mir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, Shafia Mir with the CAO's office. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of what's in our report um, and then a correction that's needed. And I'm also joined by my colleague at EWDD, Gerardo Uvalcaba. Uh, the CAO report before you recommends approval of EWDD's recommended service provider allocations for the State Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention, HHAP, funds to expand the LA RISE program. On January 28, 2021, Council and Mayor approved the allocation of these funds for an LA RISE Youth Academy to provide employment assistance services for participants who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness ages 18 to 24. Of the 2 million for the program, about 1.7 million is allocated to service providers and 200,000 is allocated for city administrative costs, including EWDD expenses. Approval of the CAO report recommendations would provide approval of EWDD's recommended service providers and authority for the department to execute contracts. Um, and then um, EWDD has a correction regarding the name of one of the service providers included in their transmittal. And because the CAO report recommendation number one references that part of EWDD's transmittal, we want to make sure that we capture that correction. So I'll ask uh, Gerardo to go ahead and present and give that amendment as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Um, in, in terms of the, the correction, it's a clerical error that was included in the funding table um, of the, the joint EWDD uh, Workforce Development Board transmittal. Uh, so in the funding table, we inadvertently refer to the Sun Valley Youth Source Center as El Proyecto del Pueblo rather than El Proyecto del Barrio. So the correct um, service provider is El Proyecto del Barrio. So we are requesting to correct um, that clerical error. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions regarding the, the LA Rise Youth Academy or um, the, the corrections requested. All right, thank, well, thank you. Thank you both for your, for your reports. Uh, let me just understand. So are we talking about a total of 226 participants? Is that what's, what's being funded? That is correct, council member. And, and review with us again how these participants are select, who's eligible to participate in this program and how they are selected to be a part of it. Sure, and so with, as with all of our LA RISE programs, um, we, our LA RISE program is really a partnership between um, a number of employment social enterprises around the city and the city's workforce development system. Um, and so with this youth academy expansion or pilot program, what we are doing is really targeting services to youth uh, or to, to the, the more than 3,000 homeless youth that have been identified within the city of LA. Um, so the, the goal of this program is really to um, twofold, is really to better coordinate with our homeless services um, housing providers to ensure that housing is part of the services that will be provided to program participants. 
Um, and then we're also opening up the, the outcome. So rather than solely being focused on employment outcomes, we're also in looking at educational outcomes. You know, since we know that the population that we're dealing with, with 16 to 24 year olds, you know, for many of them, you know, the, the preference is to re-engage uh, or to be re-engaged in, into education. Um, and so, you know, each, each of the participants um, enrolled through this program will come through, typically identified one of two ways. They will be identified through our social enterprises that, uh, that are responsible for the outreach and recruitment for many of the participants. We're also partnering with, um, with LA Unified School District. Um, and LA Unified School District employs a number of pupil services um, counselors that are focused direct or specifically on identifying homeless youth so that you know LAUSC will be a critical partner in identifying uh, participants through this program but the goal of, of the pilot is to connect you know connect youth at 18 to 24 with housing services um, much like our traditional LA rise program they each will receive up to 300 hours of transitional employment while they are receiving services and they will be connected back to our uh, public workforce system that will connect them to case management and other wraparound services that are needed uh, to help transition youth. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned the participants are 16 to 24. Is it 16 or 18? Uh, my apologies. It's 18 to 24. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Members, any other questions? Council Member Robin. Yeah, I had a question actually about the LA Rise program, which sounds really, you know, incredibly exciting. I know it's now been two to three years into that program overall. Is that correct? We are currently in the sixth year of the program. Oh. Yeah, and we will in July be starting the uh, seventh year of, of actual um, LA Rise services. Yeah, so I, you know, I was curious. Now we're adding another $2 million to this model. Um, and, you know, I was just curious whether you, you could share a little bit more evidence about kind of the success of the LA Rise model. Um, you know, at, I know that now you're making a significant investment in expanding it um, to a population that it wasn't previously serving. Um, and, and wondering whether you could share a little bit more about your thinking about why this particular model and this, um, uh, you know, to, to invest more in at this time. Sure, and um, you know, we've actually had a, a number of, of studies completed on, on the program model that you know I'd be happy to share with your office. But the you know the the, the innovation of, of the LA Rise model is really the, that the partnership between our social enterprises and our workforce system, and what that really allows us to do through the social enterprises because these are employers that are employing high barrier population. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, and, and we, when we have a number of, of homeless and, and, and informally reentry populations that may not have um, recent work experience, this really does provide that first, you know, kind of hat, very close, you know, uh, so, uh, very heavily supported work experience. You know, so, you know, somebody that may not have worked in the last 20 years could be employed, you know, at a social enterprise uh, for up to six months. And during that period, they, in addition to receiving a paycheck, they are working closely with a case manager uh, that is providing additional supports that they may need to help them transition. Um, and then in addition to the support that they are receiving through their social enterprises, they're also connecting back to a work source center or use source center case manager that is connecting to those services available through that system. So an individual you know, could come in um, they are receiving the soft skills employment training. They, they're receiving um, vocational training when it's necessary. Um, but it's really is a, a comprehensive set of services, you know, for a, a long time. So, you know, in most cases, you know, a participant will, sit, will go through the program for over six months. And the goal is to address the number of barriers that they may um, be faced with, you know, in terms of returning back to the workforce. Um, so, you know, we, we have uh, at least the, the initial uh, pilot program did include a very uh, comprehensive uh, third party evaluation uh, that was completed. 
Okay. Um, that, that was a number of years ago. We've since made a number of innovations to the program, but you know, again, we, we would be happy to share um, that, that report once again, at, you know, with your office. Yeah, that would be great. I'm sorry if I missed that when I was doing my research on this item. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, any other questions, members? Seeing none, uh, we have a recommendation to approve uh, this uh, uh, report as amended. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Yes, Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Kikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Robin. Yes. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. All right, thank you, members. Uh, Mr. Clerk, what else is before us at this time? Uh, that clears the desk, Mr. Chair. Okay, seeing no other business, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>